did not, however, identify evidence that rose to the level of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Because the evidence fell short of that standard, I declined to recommend criminal charges against Mr. Biden. And welcome back to America Decides. That was special counsel Robert Hur, who was on Capitol Hill today, defending his investigation into President Biden's handling of classified documents. Republicans argued his decision not to indict sets a double standard, while Democrats compared Biden's actions to Donald Trump's. Here was Democratic Congressman Jamie Raskin on Trump's conduct. According to the indictment, he not only refused to return the documents for months, but he also obstructed justice by enlisting others to destroy evidence and then to lie about it. Let's bring Ed O'Keefe at the White House and Nicole Killian on Capitol Hill. And Nicole, I want to start with you where this testimony was. It seemed like her was really taking it from both sides. How did Democrats and Republicans lay out their arguments today? Yeah, well, that's exactly correct. And certainly, as we have seen time and again uh, with these high profile congressional hearings, they often kind of fall on party lines and you have members who uh, basically were trying to highlight or cherry pick aspects of the report that kind of leaned into their political argument. So in the case of many Democrats, uh, they were questioning the special counsel around why he even brought up President Biden's memory, what relevance that was to his ultimate conclusion that he was not going to bring criminal charges against the president. So uh, you had some congressmen like Adam Schiff, who said that this was a political choice. Uh, you also had other members like Congressman Pramila Jayapal, who uh, suggested that the special counsel exonerated a President Biden, to which the special counsel or former special counsel said uh, that he did not. And then in terms of Republicans, many of them pressed the former special counsel as to why he did not pursue charges against the president. So uh, there was a lot of back and forth. Uh, there were videos played both of the current president and the former president as Democrats and uh, Republicans traded uh, political talking points. So uh, per usual, it was a highly contentious hearing. But that being said, former special counsel Robert Hur you know, continue to hold his ground and really kind of stick to the fundamentals of that report. And uh, Ed, to you, I mean, today we got to actually see the transcript of um, the, the two days in which the president sat with uh, her. Um, how, how has the White House been reacting? I know we have just recently heard from the White House counsel's office. Yeah, look, they, they uh, released this transcript just hours before the hearing began, and despite Republican pleas that it be done last week. Uh, but what it shows us is that, in fact, while Robert Hur may have suggested that the president couldn't recall the date of his son's death, for example, he could recall the month and the day, May 30th. He just couldn't recall the year. It shows us at other times that the president was making clear he didn't know any details about when stuff was packed up and moved to his home in Delaware, suggesting at one point that they just may have dumped stuff in his garage and left it there. Uh, he admitted uh, in the transcript as well to being a bit of a pack rat and having too much stuff uh, and that that's part of what was going on, but that otherwise had no details of, uh, of the decision to move stuff around, which led a lot of Republicans in the hearing today to suggest, well, is he really struggling with his memory or was he perhaps playing the prosecutor by just claiming that he didn't remember things? Here at the White House, they see this now as a done situation. It's, it's over with. The case is closed. Spokesman Ian Sam spoke with reporters a little while ago and had this to say. Uh, I, I think today laid bare that the special counsel, who, as you mentioned, was a Trump appointee, uh, made some inappropriate comments about the president and his report that do not match up with the transcript that now of that interview that now every American can see for themselves. And on that point about uh, partisan or political motivation, Democrats pointed out today again, her confirmed he's a registered Republican. He worked during the Trump administration and with several other key figures at the Justice Department and FBI in the past during Republican administrations. But repeatedly under question, he said there was no political motivation to calling out the president's state of mind. It's that he had to show his work, show his work primarily to the attorney general, who was ultimately going to have to make a decision about whether or not to prosecute his boss, the president of the United States. But when Democrats like Adam Schiff and Jamie Raskin turned around and said, you knew exactly what you were doing by putting that in there, because you knew this report would be released publicly. Her insisted, no, I didn't know that for certain. That might be standard practice, 
but there was no guarantee that the full report was going to be released. Either way, it's now out there. It's for the voters to decide. But in the view of the White House, at least, the case is closed. And, and on that, Ed, are, uh, is the White House looking at the testimony today and looking at how Democrats are uh, positioning themselves as kind of a, a roadmap for this moving forward, or this is uh, in their rear view? No. In fact, what you saw a lot of today from Democrats was them throwing back the age and memory questions at Republicans and Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. At least three or four times they used footage of the former president flubbing lines, unable to mispronounce words like Venezuela, confusing Joe Biden with Barack Obama, uh, and other video proof, so as to suggest if you're concerned about the current president, you probably should also be concerned about the former president. Now, why did mm -hmm. they do that, Caitlin? Remember, this hearing aired across several television platforms today live, uninterrupted, and they saw it as an opportunity to perhaps not only reach independent voters, but even Republican voters and say, if you're concerned about the current president, it's probably your own guy you should be taking a look at. Uh, notably, Republicans did not come with similar video evidence to raise questions, uh, perhaps a missed opportunity for them. Uh, but a good example of what the White House, the Biden campaign, and now by extension, Democrats everywhere will continue to do on the age question to say, if you have concerns about us, go take a look at the other guy, too. And comes on a day that both are expected to clinch their respective party nominations. Right. Um, Nicole, really quickly, um, another issue on Capitol Hill this week is TikTok. The TikTok CEO was making his rounds on Capitol Hill today, and there's a bill in Congress that will be considered tomorrow. Uh, what can you tell us? What's been the reaction? Well, we do know that the TikTok CEO was in town here in Washington, though not necessarily spotted here around the Hill, mm. but many TikTok creators and influencers were. But of course, this comes ahead of that critical vote uh, tomorrow that's expected in the House on a bipartisan piece of legislation that would require TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, to divest from the social media app, split it off, uh, sever ties uh, in order to prevent it from potentially being prohibited from app stores. We heard from uh, several members of the, you know, House who we heard from several members of the House uh, about this legislation uh, following a briefing that they received. And, uh, you know, the conclusion, particularly from the bill's sponsors, is that they felt that uh, the briefing was useful, whether or not it swayed members in favor or against the legislation. Uh, they weren't sure, but they feel confident that there is enough bipartisan support and engagement around this legislation that potentially it can move forward. The bigger issue is if it does clear the House, will the Senate actually take it up? And that's a big question mark because many senators have expressed some reservations about the legislation or might want to you know, take a look at other bills that some of their own members have come up with. So uh, there's still no guarantee uh, that TikTok eventually could potentially be banned. Uh, this will still take some time to work through Congress. Caitlin. All right. Something to keep an eye on this week, as well as everything else. Ed O'Keefe and Nicole Killian, thank you so much for your time and reporting. And next, we're going to bring in our political panel to our, analyze the RNC's new Trump-backed leadership team. Say that three times fast. You're streaming America Decides. And welcome back to America Decides. New leadership at the Republican National Committee fired dozens of staffers. The team is made up of Trump loyalists, including the former president's daughter-in-law, Lara Trump. Bracton Booker and Sabrina Rodriguez join us now. Bracton is a national correspondent for Politico, and Sabrina is national politics reporter for The Washington Post. Thanks so much for being here. I know I've seen you both recently out on the road, so good to be back here in D.C. to talk about all of our findings. Um, I do want to start with RNC, though, because this is a fascinating dynamic where you have Trump you know, leadership team handpicked is kind of reorganizing the structure at the RNC. Um, and Sabrina, I'm curious what you think about what this reorganization will mean for Trump as he, as soon as tonight, could officially, officially clinch the number of delegates needed to, to win the nomination. I mean, really seeing this happen is is not a surprise to many of us. It's yeah. really a continuation of, of what we've seen of, you know, Donald Trump really trying to take over the party infrastructure to say, you know, he's not just a, a presidential candidate, but he is the leader of the Republican Party. And that's where we see, you know, him handpicking the leadership. I think what we're, what's going to be interesting in the months to come is what are those priorities for the RNC? Because the Republican National Committee is not supposed to just look at the president. It's all supposed to look at Senate candidates, House candidates, down ballot races. And, and we've seen, you know, Trump 
focused very much on himself in the past. So how mm -hmm. is it going to look when we're looking at these down ballot races? Yeah, and Bracton, I'm curious your perspective too. I know you were just in Mar-a-Lago yeah. with me covering yes. uh, Trump's acceptance or uh, uh, speech on uh, Super Tuesday. Yes. Look, I mean, like Sabrina said, I don't think many folks are surprised by this. But in talking to Republicans today, it really depends on how close they are to Trump's orbit to get mm. a sense of like whether or not they feel like this is good or this mm -hmm. is bad. Folks mm. kind of within Trump's orbit or folks who are very supportive of the former president, they love this idea. They say, mm -hmm. like, look, remake the RNC as the eventually nom nominee will, will wants it. And look, mm -hmm. this is what this party needs. It needs unification, it needs mm -hmm. loyalty. So mm -hmm. that can only be good things for, for the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. When you get a little further out of that, that orbit, when you get to, I wouldn't say never Trumpers, but say like um, folks who are on the fence about supporting Trump, they see this as a horrible thing because they repeat what Nikki Haley said towards mm -hmm. uh, the end of her campaign. They are worried that this is going to be a personal piggy bank for uh, for the former president who's just going to pull for this and use it to pay for his legal fees. Um, speaking of Nikki Haley, Sabrina, I know you've done a lot of reporting on this. We've been all wondering, you know, where her supporters go. I, it was just last week, which feels like forever ago, that she <laughs> left the race. I know you've talked to a lot of voters in the various early states. Uh, what did you find? Right now, I mean, we're seeing it's three buckets of voters. There's, you know, the Nikki Haley supporters that say, you know, okay, well, I'm a Republican through and through. I'll end up supporting Donald Trump. Then there's the Nikki Haley supporters, some of which are Republicans, others Democrats, independents, who are saying, okay, no, I absolutely cannot vote for Trump. I'm going to have to vote for Joe Biden to, to make a point. Mm. And then there's the camp, which I think is the most fascinating camp, is the genuinely undecided people, mm. the, the what we call the double haters, that they don't like <laughs> Biden, they don't like Trump, and they're thinking, okay, I have eight months to make a decision, and I genuinely don't know where I'm going to go. Yeah, we've met a lot of those on the campaign trail as well. Um, they'll be interesting to see how they vote in big battleground states like Georgia, where we have our new polling today, uh, showing Trump leading 51 percent to 48 percent Biden. But what's interesting, Bracton, to me was that um, you see this kind of driven by a preference for uh, Trump's policies, uh, particularly among Republicans. I mean, that seems to kind of jive with what we've been finding on the trail, too, where even, you know, Republicans who may not like the former president's rhetoric do remember his policies fondly. Especially when you're talking about the economy. I think the former president was much better at selling his achievements, uh, whether or not they were, they were accurate or not. He was a great salesman about what he was doing and saying, like, it, it was because of me, it was because of my administration that you were feeling this, this boom in your pocket, right? Where I think what you're seeing uh, on, on the other side of the aisle, when you're, you're asking folks, okay, why wouldn't you give Biden another chance? Folks continually say, like, I don't feel better off than I was, than it was, than I was mm -hmm. four years ago. And when you talk to Democrats, they have a laundry list of, of accomplishments. They talk about student loan forgiveness. They talk about, um, they talk about trying to bring the country together in, in lots of ways and trying to put equity and, and, and diversity first. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, the point, it's the point that they cannot sell these, the, these ideas. Mm -hmm. They cannot sell these achievements and, and what they're selling certainly is not being bought by the American public right now. Yeah, and so much of this is what you feel versus what you see on paper. Sabrina, I mean, this seems like a challenge for the Biden administration, the Biden reelect. Um, and we kind of saw a preview of this today in the Her hearing where they were replaying Donald Trump, uh, videos of Donald Trump over and over again. I mean, that seems kind of like a playbook that they're going to uh, put in kind of in these battlegrounds. Yeah, I mean, one of the toughest challenges that the Biden administration has and, and Biden and Harris, you know, as they head on the campaign trail talking to people is a lot of the things that people are so frustrated about are kind of outside of the president's control. <laughs> I mean, inflation or the rising cost of, of living. And, you know, you hear voters talking about how expensive it is to buy a house right now or to pay rent. And I mean, living in D.C., we see it firsthand. <laughs> so I think there, there's a big frustration among voters of feeling, OK, well, I'm paying more. So they've kind of have this amnesia from the Trump mm, administration mm -hmm. and this feeling of, well, things were better then and I was paying less. And I don't know if it was because of him, but mm -hmm. I know I was paying less then. So and that's mm -hmm. a big challenge they have. So I think for them, it's really trying to make that contrast with Trump. That's mm -hmm. where they're focusing in a lot on his rhetoric, trying mm -hmm. to remind people of the things that he said, you know, whether it's racist comments or anti-immigrant rhetoric mm -hmm. um, and really trying to hone in on that and say, you're kind of remembering it 
incorrectly. <laughs> and here is the person who Donald Trump is. Interesting. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if you can persuade people to remember things right. your way. Right. Um, thank you both for being here. I know we'll see you out on the campaign trail again soon. Uh, a long way to go before the <laughs> general election. Sabrina and Brackton, thank you very much. And that does it for us today. We will be back tomorrow with another edition of America Decides at 5 p.m. Eastern. You're streaming CBS News.